Uh, I was asked to come today uh, to talk about innovation. And so I decided to talk about why ideas are not innovation. Because um, these get awfully confused sometimes. So if we talk about ideas, it's good to define creativity. And if we're looking at a good definition of creativity that I like, it's the ability to produce, produce something that is both new and useful. And when I use the word useful, it doesn't mean it has to be practical, like you know, this thing having this doohickey that allows me to go like this. It could be that a new piece of art evokes emotion. So that is useful in that, that domain, right? So creativity has both newness and usefulness or appropriateness, I'm going to say that word, um, about it. And then if we look at innovation, we're really looking at the successful introduction of something that is new and useful. So ideas by themselves are just ideas. I have a great idea. Well, I don't know if it's a great idea until I see it in practice. And innovation is taking that idea and putting it out there. So if we think about some of the biggest innovations of ever, it wasn't that someone invented them. It's that they or someone else put them out into the world. I was like, I'm a Lutheran, so I was like using Martin Luther, right? <laughs> He's not the first um, person who went, dude, Catholics aren't always right, right? He wasn't that person. The advantage he had was that when he said that, the printing press had just been invented. And so when he said things, uh, the printing press was looking for, I mean, uh, printers were looking for things to publish. And he actually gave them stuff to publish, and the idea went out to lots of people, and they heard it. And in fact, the only reason he didn't, he wasn't executed for that was he got enough wealthy people to go, hey, that's, that's a pretty good idea. I don't have to give all my money to the Catholic Church. That's pretty awesome. Um, you know, and then if you look at things like the printing press, it wasn't just the design of movable type. It was that they could actually get the, that movable type. They could print things and put them in people's hands. All right. If we look at entrepreneurship then, it's not just ideas. It's not just innovation. It's the whole shebang. So it's the discovery, evaluation, and pursuit of opportunities. Um, we actually usually say exploita exploitation of opportunities because that's an economic term, but it sounds bad, so I use pursuit. <laughs> and so entrepreneurship is not necessarily about starting a business. Some people um, will start businesses in, you know, using entrepreneurial activities, but innovation and entrepreneurship can happen anywhere. So think about the one book, one, one college um, innovation of getting us together to talk about one idea. Um, uh, think about how the um, IRS worked out that if all they did is ask for a social security number, for every single dependent you filed, Fluffy would no longer be claimed as a dependent. <laughs> and they saved billions of dollars just by that one innovation. So um, opportunities are around us all the time. We can create our own opportunities. But the point is to pursue them. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So ideas have no value in themselves. The next time someone goes, that person stole my idea. I hear it a lot. And um, my first question is, well, what did you do with your idea? Did you actually pursue it in any way? Did you try to raise money to pursue it? Did you talk to people about your idea? Right? Did you even basically write a business plan about your idea? Having an idea by itself has no value. So coming up with a great idea really isn't that great. It's the starting point. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's the only, it's the first thing you do, not the last thing you do. And in fact, we've seen people come up with great innovations that the actual product they're selling isn't all that um, uh, innovative. innovative. Yeah. I'm having a hard time today. We're going to use that as a word. So think about Disney Plus, right? This weekend, Disney Plus came out. Streaming services exist, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea that a company who has that amount of intellectual property will finally put something out, we'll see if it's innovative, right? Um, we'll, we'll wait and see on that. But it's certainly something where the actual product isn't different. But if we look at Netflix, they've always, their product has always been 
um, giving people access to entertainment. But back in the days that they used to um, deliver DVDs, probably before your time, <laughs> right? Or now with streaming video, they were the first group to really allow us to access the stuff without having to go to a physical store. And the innovation was in the process, not in the idea. And no idea has value if, it keep it, if you keep it to yourself. I hear professors say this all the time. Oh, you've got an idea. Be quiet about it. Don't tell anybody about it. Well, then you have no idea. You have something that's going in the back of your head. But it has no value until you talk to someone about it and start asking them, does my idea have value? And so this goes to this point that people always ask me, how do I protect my idea? And my answer is, don't. Don't protect it at this stage. If you have some kind of secret sauce, like you have some kind of patentable technology that could have value, well, don't necessarily talk about how it exactly works. Talk about the benefits of it. I've got this great new technology that'll allow us to get DVDs to people's home in 24 hours, right? Talk about that piece of it. Could someone steal it? Yeah. Are they likely to steal it? No. Because you usually have greater passion for your idea and implementing it than them. And if it's a big company who could easily replicate your product, they're going to be able to do that anyway. Right? Even if you, you know, no matter when in the process you talk about it. But even they often won't bother to replicate it They'll wait and see if you're successful at it and then buy you, buy your company. And then you can go, oh, boo-hoo, I don't have my idea anymore. I only have $140 million. <laughs> so um, don't keep your ideas to yourself. Uh, uh, I think the risk is far less than the potential gain. So if we talk about that, well, who do I talk to? First, you have to talk to potential customers. If we're developing a new program at Bradley, I need to talk to students and potential students like you guys about whether this is a program that has value for you. Right? Are, is this something that you're willing to do? Would this program help you? The Turner School for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, which I am a part of, um, developed an entrepreneurship minor. And its biggest value is it allows music majors to get some kind of, right, or other majors, to get some kind of entrepreneurial and business knowledge, which increases their chances of being successful as a musician. We're not necessarily always creating, deciding to create people to start major you know, music empires, but rather, how could I do what I love to do and make enough money about, uh, with it that my parents stay off my back? and let me be a music major. Yeah, yeah. I say music. You know, we also have engineers and nurses and um, physical therapists and creative writers and you know, we've got them all. Because entrepreneurship and innovation helps you get your ideas out there in the public. So talk to potential customers, talk to mentors, those people like me, right? Your professors, uh, people in the industry that you're working in. Um, I'm going to give you a list of other places that are basically professional mentors um, that you can talk to. Hey, is this idea have any value? And again, they have no desire to steal it. They have enough crap on their table right now. Their job is to see, is to really help you. Because innovation is a cultural, it's a, uh, a cultural good, right? It, the world is better with innovation in it. Right, which is why I'm allowed to stand up here with a PhD and own my own house. Being a mere woman, that was not always possible. Talk to experts. So these might be technical experts. And again, you, um, if I'm talking to someone with technical knowledge about what I'm doing, that's when I may want to start trying to think, see about how to protect my idea. Talk to accountants. Talk to lawyers. And again, you may even be able to talk to them initially for free or low cost talk to potential investors, and try to determine who to partner with. So this is great, but I do not have the skills in X, Y, and Z. And so if I don't have the um, financial background to do this, can I hire someone to do it? Do I have a roommate um, who had that background? Does my, dad, does my roommate's uncle have a friend? Who do I know that could be a potential partner? 
And then, as a business, what businesses could we partner with? And just remember that large businesses have far less stake in that relationship than you. So if you're like, I'm going to partner with Amazon, remember that partnership matters far more to you than it does to them. So we talk about in entrepreneurship the idea of a uh, MVP, which is a minimum viable product. Does that make sense? That's what they call it, a minimum viable product. And this is when you take your idea and you put it now into some kind of prototype and you get it out into the world. I was, uh, a friend of mine was wanting to start a bakery. And one of the things she did is she baked up a bunch of cupcakes during the Chicago teacher strike and brought them to the striking teachers, right? Yeah. Now, first of all, they're appreciative. That's great. But also, she could get some feedback. Which of these do you like better? I mean, come on, have you, I don't know if you've ever been in a strike. It's pretty boring. <laughs> so, so um, you know, which of these do you like better? How much would you pay for something like this? If this was catered, is this something that you would cater, right? Um, now, that's one very precise market, teachers, angry teachers, I guess. <laughs> but um, it's a way to get your idea out there. That's a minimum viable product. So if I was wanting to start, um, uh, well, I'll go there. If I was going to start a restaurant, it would probably be better to just try selling the products, you know, out of, this is being recorded, so I won't say that, like out of a food truck or a food cart. I was going to say out of my car, but that probably violates health department <laughs> things. Yeah. You know, I always say that, you know, if you're trying to sell something that is good quality but cheap, you go to Fraternity Row, right, or places where people are really hungry at 2 in the morning for some reason. Right. So, um, so go somewhere that, that, has, that has that. And you want to put it out before it's perfect. Now, you have to make sure people know that this is the first generation or a beta test, that it's not the perfect product. But one, one of the things that we learn is that when you put things in people's hands, they use it differently than you thought they were going to use it. Right? So, you know, one of the things about these clickers is that they're really great um, for right-handed people. I am right-handed. But I don't know if you noticed that they're not so great if you're left-handed. So put this in some left-handed people's um, hands, right? Yeah. Uh, I have uh, nerve damage in both my hands. I'm using this because it's my only prop at the moment. I drop this so much my students actually have a betting pool as to when I'm going to drop it in class. <laughs> Watch how people use your product because they may use it in different ways that you, than you intended. And that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It means that there's a potential market for things, hello, for things that, um, that they didn't know were there. A minimum viable products are really easy to see in technology because you've probably seen like a beta version of a piece of software or an app. It's the easiest way to see it. And they also can gather a lot of good data um, on it because it's electronic. Uh, but one of the things is that people have a tendency to use it differently than you thought. Um, or a different market picks it up than you thought. Um, and that's okay, as long as that market has value to you and can actually pay stuff. I always tell my students, and I think all students, if you're looking at a product to sell to students, don't, because students are broke. And it has to be something really valuable to you before you're willing to pay for it. And not going to pay for this clicker. I have to have this clicker in order to do my job. But Bradley won't buy me one, so I had to buy this one. <laughs> so um, get it out there before it's perfect. Get it out um, to where you can observe it being done. And this is why I recommend taking like um, cultural anthropology classes. Learning how to observe people has value. And really seeing how they do this. I knew of an anthropologist um, who's working for a fast food company whose name shall not be mentioned. And she actually sat in cars with parents when they took their kids through drive throughs And one of the things that seems really obvious but might not be unless you observe it is that all the french fries are eaten before you get home. Because uh -huh. yeah. they're, they're going to be cold by the time you get home. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But one of the things that was a struggle is that you know, the mom's in the front driving her minivan and the kids want ketchup on their fries. <laughs> and getting the ketchup open Right, and pour it onto fries while you're driving and putting them back 
isn't safe, right? It's messy. So is there a way to develop a product that you could sell to a fast food company that um, could actually help people dip their ketchup in? Or cut, bring, have the fries pre-ketchuped in some way? I don't know. Don't, that sounds kind of disgusting. <laughs> but the idea is put that idea out there. Do others think it's kind of disgusting? I, I'm not a sauce person. So maybe a pre-ketchuped, like ketchup in the fry? Okay, I've got a million dollar idea. No, I don't because I haven't tried it yet, right? Right. <laughs> so, um, so how do you actually observe people using your product? And you can often, um, one of the things people don't seem to realize is you can ask people things like, hey, um, I'm not saying necessarily you have to ride in the back of their minivan, but can, can you go and observe them doing stuff? Can you say, hey, will you try this product out for me? I'll give you five bucks or something and have them try it out and see how they use it. What I don't recommend is asking them too many questions about what they want, because people don't know what they want. I want you to ask them questions on how, do, how would you use this? Is this something useful? Does this solve a problem for you? When you ask people what they want, they, they don't actually give you an answer that's very innovative. They don't really give you feedback that's useful. They tend to just give you something that's a slight improvement on what's out there before. And don't have them be all friends and family, because friends and family are too kind to you, <laughs> usually. Um, get, get people out there. And they could be your, you know, like if you're selling something to kids, ask your friends, can I borrow your kids in a way that's not creepy or illegal? And can I, you know, have them look at these things? Kids are very honest about stuff. <laughs> So get, make sure that you're asking questions, getting the idea in such a way that you can get feedback. Which is why it's so important to have on your website or um, on your app or on your device itself ways for them to contact you. Hey, this didn't work. This never works, et cetera. Follow you know, your Google alerts on your companies or your product's names, right? So that you know what people are doing with the product because it might be different than what you thought. That makes sense? Yeah, Okay. It does. So where do I go? So if I had a great idea, and I don't know if you guys are here because you're forced to be here for extra credit, or if you do have an idea that you want to do. So I've got an idea, what are, where do I go? How do I go from idea to innovation? Thankfully, because this is a public good, innovation is a public good, our community wants you guys to innovate. There are free and or cheap, but mostly free, <laughs> um, people out there and groups out there designed to help you. And I just listed a few here. Um, there's actually quite a few more. So the Tenor Center for Entrepreneurship is at Bradley. It holds the Small Business Development Center and the International Trade Center. Um, that is uh, funded by state and federal government to help people create new businesses. And you can go in there with an idea or with a fully fledged business that's running and say, this is what I need help with. And they will help you get that help. They either will give you advice themselves or get you to the next stage. Because they are interested in creating jobs. The Pure Innovation Alliance is brand new. Um, they are all over, oh wait, I skipped one, but okay, I'll get back. Pure Innovation um, Alliance is all over social media right now. They've got the Innovation Hub. They've just um, created an innovation district in downtown Peoria. They are a group here designed to not only increase innovation in the Peoria area, but convince young people to stay here rather than go think that they have to go to Chicago or St. Louis or Minneapolis to be an entrepreneur. In fact, we've got plenty of stuff going on here that you can be successful, right, at half the rent <laughs> with an average commuting time of 17 minutes, which is not the case in Chicago. Um, in fact, um, the, I guess you'd call him Vice President of Pure Innovation Alliance, Jess Brown, is the VP of Design for Aspiration, which is a, um, a fintech, a financial technology company in uh, California. It is cheaper for him to live here with his family and go there a couple times a month, fly there, than to live there. Jeez. And what he's found is that um, he has much better control over his time uh, when he has to manage it. So he, he works, his, uh, he's the VP of design, so all of his designers are all over the uh, country now. And he uses things like Google Hangout um, to talk to them and respond. He has specific times that no one can bother him, specific times that they can. And he gets to be at home with his kids 
right, and see their, you know, go to their basketball games and tuck them in at night and do the things that he wasn't able to do when he was commuting an hour and a half one way. All right. So um, we're seeing more and more people like Jess come back to Peoria to realize that they can do everything they need to without the lifestyle um, risks, I guess, that there would be in Silicon Valley. The, um, the average, I heard this yesterday, the median um, uh, cost of a house in the Peoria area is $75,000. In Silicon, San Jose, in the Silicon Valley, it's $1.3 million. Jeez. Slightly different. Yeah, just slightly. <laughs> and um, so this is a group who's really designed to help people realize that the resources are here to do this. And you can have a, a lifestyle that, that matters to you. It doesn't even have to be kid-oriented. It could be just, I don't want to spend my day in a car. Mm -hmm. um, Startup Greater Peoria is part of the um, um, Economic Development Council. And uh, they are really here to help start uh, new ventures and innovation in this area. Um, they run, um, among other things, the Nest co-working space, which allows you to have a, a desk or a spot on a table, good Wi-Fi, good coffee, a conference room that, you know, when you need it, at very, very low rent. Um, and then not only can you work in an area like that very cheaply, but you've got people around you who are in similar situations who can help support and mentor you. And then we have people who have office hours there to act as professional mentors. Um, we have meetups. And if you go to the Peoria Innovation Alliance website, there's a bunch of meetups. There's you know, hackathons, there's designer meetups, there's, um, you know, um, web development meetups, there's all these different kinds of uh, 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 big data, data science meetups. Um, all these uh, kinds of meetups where you can meet people with similar backgrounds. Because one of the most important things is if you have an idea is to network and talk to people about it, you've got to build that network. <clears throat> Um, I mentioned NABO here, that's the Na National Association, Association of Women Business Owners. There's quite a few professional organizations in this area. Um, SCORE, I did not put up here, the Senior Corps of Retired Executives. Again, free advice to you from uh, um, older executives. They tend to be from larger companies, so around here they tend to be from like CAT or OSF, mm -hmm. but they, they do often have great networks of people and great ideas. And all of this that I'm talking about is free or cheap. I want to say inexpensive. Cheap sounds cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and most is like, you know, like some of the Pure Innovation Alliance stuff, you have to buy coffee. You know, so we're not talking massive amounts of money. Yeah. Um, and that's just some of the different places that you can that you can go to in this area. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So never say someone stole your idea. You want to say someone stole my innovation that I had protected correctly, right? <laughs> If you had an idea that someone seems to have, have a similar idea, it was probably been a really good idea. It's just that they got to the process of innovating it earlier. Um, I knew one, uh, I saw that um, it was a yoga mat and it was round, it was like six feet round. And they were all upset because they invented this and some yoga supply company made a knockoff of it. And I'm like, it's a round yoga mat. What's the innovation there? It's round. There's nothing to protect, right? Make yours of a better quality and somehow use your brand to make it people want to buy it. But the roundness is not in itself an innovation. It's just round. I kind of like the idea, but yeah. It's just yoga, material, yoga mat material in round form. Okay, questions for anyone, from anyone. I did put my, um, I am out of business cards because we have a new building and I'm waiting for my new ones with my new office number. Um, uh, but you can, the easiest way to email me is esblair at bradley.edu. The easiest way for me to respond is by doing that. Um, I am also on the Peoria County Board, so if you live in Peoria County, um, I represent you. Also vote for me. <laughs> if you're in my district. Um, I was going to say, no campaigning on campus. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Edit that part out. Yeah. I don't know how many of you live in my district anyway. Um, but part of my, 
I'll say this, this is not a campaign thing, but uh, the reason I joined Peoria County Board was because I have this background in innovation, I wanna see more of that happening. Um, and think that we're, like for example, we're sitting on a bunch of money that we could be spending to get you guys to an MVP. All right, questions I can answer for you. I have one related to sure. something you just said. Um, so is Peoria County involved with the Innovation Alliance then? So I don't believe we're doing any funding yet. Okay. I just got my four inch budget for next year. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll find out soon. Okay. <laughs> but we actually are sitting on money designed to create jobs. Mm -hmm. The city is as well. And um, what we, huh? State money, I'm assuming? Yeah, it's okay. mostly state money. Yeah. And um, it, it's one of these things we've had, they've been sitting on for a while. And um, uh, the problem is, is that government, you know, elected officials are very risk adverse. Mm -hmm. And when you give entrepreneurs money, most will lose it. <laughs> but that's what you need to do, because if I give it to 100 people, 98 will lose it. I don't want to say lose it, they will not make it back. Mm -hmm. One will make it back and one will be a home run. And that home run will, will create the jobs and the money that you lost for the others. And it's more like one out of 10 versus one out of 100. And um, one of the things is if I give you money, a small amount of money to test an idea and you spend that money testing the idea and you figure out this is a terrible, terrible idea, that's really valuable information. So if I give you 10 grand to go come up with a prototype and show it to people, and people are like, I'm not gonna buy that, right? You've learned something for 10 grand, where if you'd gotten a bunch of bank loans and investors and started a business and created this and then found out no one wants to buy it, you've spent so much money. So we call that failing cheap, failing fast, failing cheap. I've heard a lot recently in the news about um, the, the lady that created bump boxes. Mm -hmm. Um, are there other examples of that? Uh, around here? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Okay. Um, so we have, now you're going to ask me for names, and I am clearly, <laughs> okay. I, I'm clearly not, I, I'm, I grew up in a desert, and whenever it's raining like this, my head goes into a fog. <laughs> and I've lived in the Midwest for 25 years. I have no excuse. Uh, um, so there's bump boxes. Uh, there's a uh, group called Something Welding, which I'll come up with the name who have made things like vegan leather. Oh, I saw yeah. that in the paper the other day, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, the Autonomous Vehicle Company um, that is developing software, in Morton, that's developing oh. software uh, for autonomous vehicles. And in fact, they're now in downtown. Hmm. There's, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to come up, I mean, no, it's far more than that, I'm just trying to come up with some. And there's simple ones like um, Chelsea Tams, who is an art on, arts entrepreneur. She actually just left for Chicago. But she, if you've seen any of this hand lettering billboards and things for the city of Peoria, she did all those. And she's a Bradley grad. Um, natural fiber welding. Natural fiber welding. I knew natural was in it and welding. And I can yeah. remember this, the actual word that yeah. mattered, which was fiber. Um, the um, uh, Tada is a brand new company that is starting to spin off ideas. Um, I, I don't even know if I can explain it. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, there, there's a, I mean, there's a bunch of them around here um, that, that are really going. And this doesn't include things like the fact that OSF's Jump Simulation Trading Center, Jump Trading Simulation Center, is spinning off um, uh, medical devices and other innovations that you and I would not really understand. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but they're doing that, right? Um, in fact, I heard... Um, yesterday, I heard of a company called uh, VirtuSense that uses um, AI to detect when someone in a hospital bed is getting out of the hospital bed. So you know how they used to have those, they have those mats? Mm -hmm. Well, this actually is a sensor, and it sends it to the um, phone of um, the nurse or whoever needs yeah. to watch it 20% um, faster than the old sensors. Wow. And so they can get to them. Because if you're not aware of this, when people fall and hurt themselves in a hospital, the hospi Medicare puts the hospital at 100% at cost for any repairs. So if someone breaks a hip, that's on them. Let alone when people fall in hospitals and break a hip, they don't always, a lot of times they don't get out of the hospital. Um, 
so this, uh, that this is a device that um, I just heard about. And um, I know, like, um, I have a dog who volunteers at OSF, and I follow her around, and people jump out of bed and set off these alarms all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, why don't you sit back down? No, oh, I want to pet the dog. I'll bring the dog to you. Uh -huh. And then people come rushing in, because, yeah. So, so, yeah, these stuff, you don't know they're in there until they go off either. Right, yeah. So um, uh, these are just, uh, just some of the ones around here. And then there's a lot, you know, you don't have to be a brand name to be doing what you love. I have a student who designs and alters wedding dresses. It allows her to work uh, nine months out of the year and go snowboarding. And she actually just opened up her own uh, bridal boutique. And um, uh, she um, is, uh, um, and just had a baby and is able to do what she wants. You know, I have people who have, um, who've opened restaurants, which I always think is a terrible idea, even though I like to eat, but. <laughs> Um, I have, you know, isn't, isn't the restaurant failure? Oh, it's just so high. Amazingly bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's so high, yeah. and it's just it's hard. It's a very high upfront cost. The profit margins are low. The people in the back usually are, you know, work release from prisons. Um, the people up front are probably stealing from you far more than the work release from prisons people. It's just a bad. It's it's a it's hard to do well. Other questions? I've got some time. I think the idea is that if you have an idea, don't sit on it. Start talking to people about it. And um, I never tell someone their idea is stupid. I tell them where to go next. Sometimes I think it's stupid, but sometimes they have proven me wrong. <laughs> and so who am I to judge? <laughs> so there's a very famous, um, famous it's probably apocryphal uh, story about Fred Smith, who's the inventor of FedEx. Um, he was at Harvard Business School getting his MBA, and he wrote up the business plan for FedEx. And the professor said, this will never work. You can never compete against the, the post office. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's professor's like, worst fear is that we're going to be that person who makes it into that story. Uh, right? Yeah. He will set fire, though. Yeah. <laughs> if they're really an entrepreneur. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, and I had, um, I had a student, and, and we bashed his idea, and he came back with a better one. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. One of the things we know about entrepreneurs is that they're delusional, like <laughs> clinically delusional, and it's a good thing yeah. because that means that when, they, when we tell them no, they don't listen to us. Right. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is, is that some of them are just bad ideas and they should have listened to us, but some prove us wrong. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the point of the book in that respect mm -hmm. is that you read through the book here and these ideas of taking ice down to Brazil. And it's like, that's the stupidest thing you're ever going to hear. <laughs> and, but yet, all of a sudden, it was like, OK. It, it, you know, eventually, it got it to the point where everybody was cooling things constantly. Right. And that's one of the things to, to remember, too, is that if you're trying to come up with, like, I want to I be successful as an entrepreneur, what I need to do is ask people what keeps them up at night. And maybe ask people in specific jobs, right? What keeps you up at night? Um, and what you're looking for are those migraine problems. I've also heard them that you know you want the morphine solution, not the Advil solution, right? You want the one that people just will pay anything for <laughs> to make it work. And um, I, I hate to use that one among my students, but yeah. but you um, you want to have you really want to ask people not what do they want, but what are their problems? What keeps them up at night? You know, not the minor problems. Um, I know for one, like I, I mean, this is this is kind of minor. But I spent a lot of money on it, so maybe not. Um, I love DoorDash. I love DoorDash. Do you guys know DoorDash? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's expensive because you're paying delivery fee and a tip that you would not usually spend if, if you're getting from Portillo's, which I have no excuse because I live four minutes from Portillo's, <laughs> and I do it all the time. I mean, Portillo's allows you to even like order it ahead of time and just walk in and walk out. And I still, I have a lot of pets at my house, just say this. Clearly, this solves a problem for me, is that I want access to food, and I don't want to leave my house. And one of the things I like about DoorDash more than even just like calling up the pizza companies, I don't have to talk to a human. That sounds terrible, but I talk to humans all day. <laughs> and I'm just introverted enough that I'm done by the end of the day. I just want to sit there with seven kittens in my lap and um, in my PJs and just like 
have this conversation of, hi, here's your food, bye, bye, thank you, have a safe drive. And that's it, that's all I want to have. And, um, and I will pay the extra money for that so that I don't have to either cook. It's not even the cooking that bothers me, it's the cleaning up after, right? Um, you know, uh, I, but I can do all that just by having DoorDash. I got food from Janine uh, Village the other day. It's, a, it's Indian food. Mm. Quite good. Other questions or anything? Um, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, I highly recommend you check out one of these things. If you are an ICC student looking at going to a four-year college, Bradley has a fantastic entrepreneurship program. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Okay. There actually is, a, I think still, there's an um, ICC to Bradley Entrepreneurship Scholarship. Um, so if you're looking at majoring in entrepreneurship, um, there's actually a special scholarship for that, that Bradley has for ICC students. And I have many students who come from ICC and come in as a junior. And they're very successful and get out in two years. Cool. So I want to make sure. I, sorry, I had to plug Bradley if I'm here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, I have some great students. So the, the um, uh, director of operations, kind of uh, the manager of 20, uh, uh, 225 um, is one of my, and he actually uh, um, is really the director of operations for, yeah, for, Pat, for the Capitalist family uh, um, series of businesses they have. So, um, so he, he's doing really well. Okay. <laughs> You're like, I know Patrick. He was, yeah, he made his rounds here the other day. Did he really? Mm -hmm. He's a good, he's good student. So anyway, just let me know if you have any questions on anything or anything I can help. I hope you enjoy that book. I haven't read the book yet. I saw the Netflix series because I do have Netflix. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. And like right now, there's two movies. Um, there's, uh, I think it's called Current with Benedict Cumberbatch about current the fight war. between, uh, current, war, current war, between um, Edison um, and Nikola Tesla about oh. which current is going to actually mm -hmm. be put into systems. And that shows you the difference between an inventor Right, a person with an idea and a person who's an innovator, right? So Edison won even though he had a far inferior product. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ford versus Fiari is just out yes. about yeah. uh, Carroll Shelby and, the, and creating the, um, the Ford, G, the Mustang GT. So um, two great films, well, I haven't seen them. <laughs> great films for entrepreneurship. So you can go see them and not feel guilty that you're not studying for something. Yeah, or out in the theater. Yeah, or it just was out. Ford versus Ferrari just came, just came out. out. And the current war was out, so it may now be kind of dwindling back. But um, So it'll probably show up on Netflix. <laughs> so anyway, go, go enjoy those. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.